So hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Anime Z. Thank you guys for giving so much love and support to my channel. Today what we gonna see, let me explain you. In this story Azuka was at the scene when All Might originally fought All for One. All for One gave All Might a fatal wound which killed the symbol of peace. But not before he turned All for One's head into a pulp and gave Azuka OFA. Bakugo decided to suck it up and took Izuka's hand when they were kids, so they're still friends. Framed for a crime he didn't commit, Izuka Midoriya is sentenced to life in Tartarus prison for committing treason. He was eventually released five years later and disappeared for another five with but hatred for current hero society and his former classmates. Now follow Izuku and the people who believed in him as they reunite with the classmates that turned their backs on him. Let's start the story. Chapter 1, Prologue we see a 29-year-old Izuku sleeping in bed. He's tossing and turning while sweating immensely due to having a nightmare. Izuku, stop it! Stop it! Izuku woke up with a jump, breathing heavily as he looked around. He saw nothing in his room as he looked at the mirror and took a few deep breaths. Izuku, why can't y'all leave my head? Dad? Izuku turned to the voice and his face softened. Standing in the middle of the door frame were his two sons, Koda and Katsuma. Both had looks of concern plastered on their faces. Izuku, I'm sorry boys, did I startle the two of you? It's just a nightmare. Koda and Katsuma. The boys walked up to their father and hugged him. Koda, it okay dad. Katsuma, yeah, they can't hurt you anymore. Izuku smiled as he hugged his son's back. He then got up and moved them out of the room as he realized what time it was. Izuku, thanks boys, I needed that. Now you two go get ready, we got two hour before school starts. Katsuma and Koda left to get dressed in their school uniforms as Izuku went to his bathroom. He did his routine of taking a shower, brushing his teeth, and combing his hair. Izuku left the bathroom got dressed while listening to the radio. He was about to put on his shoes when he heard it. Radio. In other new, last night pro heroines Arsenal and Gravitax saved a bus full of children thanks to their quick tea. Izuku threw his shoe at radio, sending it flying into a wall and destroying it. Izuku every day with the same old stupid hero crud. As Izuku tied his shoelaces, he noticed that his hand was starting to shake in pain. He runs over to his dressing table, opening a drawer to take out a bottle of pills and swallow two pills. When the pain left, Izuku put on his gloves and rings before looking into the mirror. His gloved hand touched the scar on the side of his left eye. Izuku frowned as he remembered that day. Izuku's sad face sighs, stop thinking about that day. Just focus on your kids, or at least the two you still have. Izuka turned from the mirror and cleaned up the broken radio, putting the pieces in the trash before taking out a new one from the closet. Meanwhile with Momo and Ochako. Dream Izuku, and to my former fiancés, I can't wait for karma to come around and bite you both in the ass. I hate the two of you with all my heart. Momo slash, Iraraka Izuka we're sorry. Izuka please forgive us. The two girls jumped awake from their bed with tears fresh on their faces. They looked around their large bedroom only to find no sign of their betrayed lover. Momo started hyperventilating and grabbed a bag on her nightstand, breathing into it as Uraraka rubbed her back. Once Momo was was calmed down, the two girls hugged each other and let the tears flow naturally. They slowly opened their eyes and saw their daughters looking at them with concern. Momo, oh sweeties. I'm sorry did we wake the two of you. Eri and Mahoro. Eri and Mahoro just walked up to their mothers and hugged them. Eri and Mahoro. We miss him too. Momo and Ochako turned on the waterworks even more as they hugged their daughters for the next hour and a half. Later. Momo is driving with Ochako in the passenger seat and Eri and Mahoro in the back. Ochako. So honey, are the two of you ready for y'all's first day at UA? Eri slash. Mahoro yes we are. Yeah we're gonna outshine all those extras. Momo. You spend way too much time with Bakugo. His personality is rubbing off on you. Ochako. Yeah. He's always a bad influence. Mahoro, Uncle Kakin isn't always a bad influence, Dada Bayo. Eri giggled with stars in her eyes. A few minutes later, the group arrived at the front gates of UA Hero College. Momo, bye sweetie. You two have fun on y'all's first day. Ochako, and if anything happens call us. Eri, come on mommy, you know we're Grunkle Aizawa's favorite nieces. Mahoro, yeah he loves us. Momo and Ochako chuckled knowing the fright that would await their daughters. Eri and Mahoro got out and walked inside with Momo and Ochako taking one last look at them. Momo, ten years sure does fly by so fast, huh? The two got sad again thinking about him. Ochako, sadly, he lost a decade of their lives because of us. 
Momo sighed sadly as they drove off to the Star Alchemist Agency. Momo and Urarika were smart women. They excelled in politics, business, law, management, accounting, and administration. They graduated from UA with the highest grades in all their classes. And finally, they were in the top five heroes in Japan. But one area they struggled in was cars. Their expertise was non-existent since their knowledge was this. Key goes into the ignition, engine starts, and you drive. And that was the only knowledge they had about cars since they didn't have a need to learn more about cars. That was until today, of course. The car had started to make a strange sound when the ignition started. Momo and Urarika chalked it up to something minor like a rattling noise from an unaligned exhaust, something they've heard a thousand times and so they promptly ignored it. The noise got worse when they pulled into the highway as the car began to shake, but the two continued to disregard it. They were halfway to work when suddenly, bang, Momo and Urarika looked to the front of their car to see that the bonnet looked as though someone put a grenade in it. Smoke wafted up from the many fresh hole on the hood as the engine died and the car screeched to a halt a few dozen meters down the road. Needless to say, the girls were, for a lack of a better word, panicked. Smoke was still rising when they got out of the car to see what happened. They started to regret not taking the automotive mechanics course during their third year. Momo was about to lift the hood when a gloved hand slammed down onto the hood, causing the creation heroine to jump back into Urarika. The two girls took an immediate disliking to the man. While he smelled fine, he looked as though he was a Yakuza thug. The man didn't seem to notice as he looked at them like they were about to commit an unthinkable evil. Izuku, I wouldn't touch that yet if I were you too. Unless you all want some nasty burns on your hands. Momo and Urarika looked at him a bit confused like he was speaking a different language. The man sighed as he took his water bottle and poured it on the hood to prove his point. It was Urarika's turn to jump back when the hood started to hiss as the water sizzled like it was on a hot plate. Urarika. Who are you? Urarika glared at him with suspicion as her hand hovered over the shock stick in her belt. Imagine the ones Black Widow uses. Memories of the Shai Hasaikai raid and Eri crying after having a nightmare coming back. Izuku, I'm a lawyer but I also help my uncle at his auto shop sometimes like today due to also having an engineering degree. I was a few cars back when I saw what happened, so I decided to see if I could help. The girls would have refused if the car didn't make another noise, causing them to jump back a bit. The man popped the hood and started to look and see what was wrong. Momo, yes, yes that would be very much appreciated. But if you don't mind me asking, what's your name exactly? Izuku, names Izuku Midoriya Mams. Momo and Urarika froze and their eyes widened as tears fell from their face. Momo slash Ochako Zuzu? Izuku froze as only two people ever called him those names. He frowned as he met their faces, looking pissed. The two sides looked at each other. One with longing and regret, the other with nothing but scorn and hatred directed at the others. How did these three one-star-eyed lovers now end up as good as strangers? Well, it all started with a mistake. Ten years flashback, older Izuku is narrator for parts of this chapter, unless stated otherwise like in this chapter, the first act will be told from third-person point of view. Are we really doing this? Fine, I guess you all should know how we got to that point in the prologue. But first how about a little backstory about myself? My name is Izuku Midoriai, as you all probably know by now. My mother is Inko Midoriya, and she's a doctor. My father is Hisashi Midoriya, and he left when I was around two. At the age of four, I was diagnosed as quirkless due to having an extra pinky toe joint. That didn't stop me from thinking I could be a hero. My best friend Katsuki Bakugo thought the same as well. And why mom enrolled me in some martial arts and self defense classes to help me train. Of course, I had to deal with, with my peers bullying me though they kept it at a minimum out of fear of getting exploded into giblets by Kakin if they did. The teachers stopped it for the most part since they didn't want their star student getting arrested for murdering a classmate. But my life then changed for the better when I was nine. I was heading home from the grocery store when I accidentally walked into a battle. It was All Might fighting a villain who looked like he belonged in a corporate office. All Might was struggling against him. Not only was he strong but the villain could also use multiple quirks. Despite my best efforts, the villain noticed me and forced All Might take a hit that could have killed me. After he grabbed the villain and punched him into the ground repeatedly. Unfortunately, the hit proved fatal to All Might. He spent his last moments comforting me, reassuring me that it wasn't my fault. He then told me about his quirk, one for all, and passed it on to me before dying. I blacked out afterwards and woke up in a hospital surrounded by my mom, Kaken, and Natsuki and Uncle Masaru, Sir Naitai, and Gran Torino who I learned was the man that taught All Might. 
I told them all about what happened while Night Eye and Grand Torino explained what OFA was. I trained under Sir and Grand for the next nine years. I spent the last four years of my training in the U.S. I also learned that the spirits of the former holders inhabited the quirk. I found it quite funny seeing Mirai Sensei nearly have heart attacks when All Might and Nanashimura appeared as ghosts for the first time. I hadn't told Grand yet though. When I reached Yue, I got two girlfriends, Ochako Yuraraka and Momo Yayorozu, though her father seemed to have a strong disliking towards me. I made lots of new friends and enemies. I thought things couldn't get any better. I was right since instead they got worse. Which brings us to this point. It all started on a Sunday evening a few weeks into my second year at UA, and I still remember the day like it was yesterday. I had just finished an intense workout session that afternoon, so I walked back to the dorms while dead tired. Izuku, God I'm so tired. Can't wait to get in bed and snuggle next to my darlings. I muttered to myself, a habit I got rid of due to finding it annoying. I found it weird that neither Ochako or Momo had texted or called me all day. Even weirder was that the teachers and some of my friends would distance themselves from me or treat me with hostility. Even Gran Torino was treating me like I was a villain. I foolishly decided to brush those thoughts aside and not let them bother me. What a mistake that turned out to be. When I entered the dorms, I found that no one was inside. It was weird since there was usually someone in the common room studying or fooling around. Izuku, hello, anybody there? Nobody answered so I just shrugged and walked up the stairs to my room filled with hero merch. Especially merch for the teachers of Ultra Academy which I would burn most of if I could go back in time. Once I opened the door to my room I was meet with a punch. Not a punch that would make me black out but one that was aimed at my stomach. It was so powerful it broke a couple of ribs, took the air right out of my lungs, and caused me to vomit a little bit. I barely had time to catch my breath before a second punch landed on my back and sent me tumbling down the stairs. I tried to get back up, even though my breath was erratic and my vision was blurry. Izuku, what the hell? Before I could do or say anything else, several octopus tentacles started to wrap around my neck and choke me. As I was being lifted into the air, I saw both my class and class 2 be sending murderous glares at me as Tamaki Senpai furiously slammed me into the floor before slamming me onto the floor and sealing repeatedly. He then threw me out a window which caused me spit out blood as I tumbled through the grass while both classes rushed outside. Izuku, what are you all doing? My question fell on deaf ears as Monoma came and kicked me in the chest with both, hardening, and steel, active. I tried to run away, but I fell due to having no energy left. Kirishima, you're not running away from this you unmanly traitor. Both Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu grabbed my arms and put their feet on my calves to keep me in place while they activated their quirks. I was confused on what they were doing until I heard Denki shout. Kaminari, indiscriminate shock 1.3 million volts. He shot me with 1.3 million volts of electricity, causing me to scream in pure agony as OFA subconsciously activated to mitigate the damage. But I guess whatever god out there must have really hated me cause that didn't cause me to pass out, not in the slightest. When Denki was done, both hard skin users released me as Lichtenberg scars and black skin covered most of my torso and arms. I fell face down onto the ground thinking that the worst of it had finally passed until I heard Ida from behind me. Ida, recipro burst. He slammed his foot down onto my back. I screamed in agonizing pain as I both felt and heard something break. The rest of the time was almost a blur as nearly everybody took a turn to use me as their personal punching bag. The only person to not do so was Todoroki. Shoto only asked me why, his face holding a mixture of sadness, hurt, and disappointment. But one moment will always stay craved in my memory forever no matter how hard I tried to get rid of it in order to move on. Momo and Yurarika both walked past the others and up to my bloody, broken, and bruised body. I foolishly thought that they would defend me, that they would tell the others to stop. But in the end, they didn't do any of that. Instead Momo just backhand slapped me, the engagement ring cutting the side of my face, mere centimeters from my left eye. She and Yurarika then took off their rings and hurled them at me as I saw them look at me with nothing but fury, disgust, and hatred in their eyes. Momo, I can't believe we fell in love with a traitor. Our friends almost died because of you. Yurarika, I hope you rot in hell you disgusting piece of shit. I painfully reached out and grabbed the rings, holding them in my fist as tears ran down my face. Mizu, oh trust me when I say Miss Yurarika, he will. I slowly turned around and saw the staff and Gran Torino behind me, all of them looking at me in disgust. Mizu slowly walked up to me, showing a stone-faced expression that hid how he felt. Mizu, Izuka Midoriya, 
You are under arrest on the charges of treason against Ultra Academy and multiple counts of attempted murder against its faculty and students. As we have all the proof of your crimes and guilt, you will be sent to Tartarus prison for the rest of your despicable life. Misa stepped aside as Gran Torino spoke up. Gran Torino, you're an absolute disgrace who deserves everything that happens to you from this point forward. All Might made a mistake. Tashinori should have just let him kill you. Gran Torino then launched into the air and sent a kick to my face. The rage-filled power behind kick combined with the exhaustion I felt finally caused me to fall unconscious. Hours later. When I woke up, I could barely move my body due to how much pain I was in. I looked down at my body that was covered in bandages. Izuku, W, W H E, where dot am dot I? I wondered aloud as slowly as I could to minimize the pain in my broken jaw. Thanks a lot, Sensei. Then I heard the voice of one of the people I thought I'd never have to meet ever again. You're in your new forever home, boy. I slowly turned around and saw them. Older Izuku as narrator. Hell. That's what I would describe the four months of being stuck in that bandaged cocoon while my body healed. I couldn't even move because doing so even slightly would send a jolt of pain through my entire body. I spent most of that time in the vestige world talking with the past users. Nana and Tashinori both apologized to me for what had happened when I entered the world for the first time while in prison. The two were distraught, saddened, angry, and disappointed by what Gran Torino did. The second week of October was when they took of my bandages. The black skin that covered my torso were gone, but my arms were still covered in them. The Lichtenberg scars got a bright blood-red color to them. Turns out I underestimated how much damage Kaminari did, cause the Lichtenberg scars went all the way to my legs as well. The doctors weren't sure how I could still feel my limbs let alone move them. They thought it might have been due to my quirk granting me increased durability. The doctor came in with a chart, looking at me, 9, fleck turn, stain, and overhaul. The four of them and their teammates had been there for me since the day I got sent to this hellhole. They would feed me, read to me, wheelchair me around the prison, etc. If it weren't for them, I would have gone insane. Anyways, the doctor looked at us and shook her head. Doctor, okay. So we did some tests, and it's not looking good. So let's start with the least serious problem. Nine, concerned, is it that bad? Doctor, nodding, your arms are completely black now, sorry. Thankfully it's only the top layer of skin so it can be replaced. However, we'll need to look for a skin donor since there isn't enough on your own body to replace it. Izuku next. Doctor, your torso suffered permanent nerve damage. I'm sorry, but we can't relieve the pain you'll feel going forward. Fleck turn, you said can't, that would imply. Doctor, there are treatments available to mitigate the pain and make it feel like a minor body ache. But due to all the recent budget cuts on prison medical aid, there's no way for the boy to receive said treatment. Stain, damn it. Doctor, of course the nerves and legs are fine, but they'll be extra sensitive for a while. Your arms have permanent nerve damage, and you'll feel some trembling and shaking. Izuku, great, so I get feel like limbs are being stabbed every time I move them for the next few days. Doctor, yes, which brings me to the final problem. The doctor showed us an x-ray of my back and legs. Doctor, we were able to put your spine back together but it's still weak in some places. You have fractures along your spine that'll cause pain and trouble with bending and twisting. Your legs also suffered bone fractures, torn muscles, and ripped tendons. Your knees were also very injured and likely won't allow you to move if ever. I suggest ordering a wheelchair or some crutches. Overhaul. How about you deactivate this quirk suppression collar on my neck for right now? I could use my quirk and fix all his injuries with just a single touch. Doctor, while that could technically work given the mechanics of your quirk, if the commission or the diet got wind of this they'd most definitely rain down hell on us for allowing an S-rank villain to use their quirk freely. Overhaul, well I'm out of ideas. Izuku, guess I'm stuck in a wheelchair forever I guess. Nine, he'll do physical therapy. I looked at Nine like he was crazy. Izuku, I don't know what you think could happen but I don't care. My life is bleak over. My body will be in constant pain for the rest of my life. Not to mention I possibly won't be able to walk again. Stain, shocked, but your Atlas, the enduring hero, the beacon of hope. The hero who doesn't waver in the face of his enemies. Izuku, I was Atlas. But now I'm in prison, disgraced and betrayed by my allies. Even if by some miracle I was exonerated... My body is broken so I can barely use my quirk. I can't be a beacon of hope if I can't use my quirk. 9. So you're gonna give up just like that? Just because you're nearly crippled and can't use your quirk? Atlas is a beacon not because of the strength he wields, 
but because he refuses to buckle or yield when faced with the cruelty of this world. Me, Stain, Overhaul, Flectern, Muscular, Moonfish, the Gnomus. You've faced insurmountable challenges countless times before, and each time you've overcome them. Do the therapy, prove to the people that betrayed you, prove to them who you are and why you're a hero. I looked at Nine as my entire life flashed before my eyes. The USJ, Hosu, New York, Naba Island, Shaiha Saikai Mission, Hummer Eyes. I never surrendered then so why should I now? I've endured punishment after punishment, beating after beating, and not once did I think about stopping. I grabbed the armrests of my wheelchair and stood up shakily, surprising the doctor but causing Fleck turn, nine, stain, and overhaul to smirk in approval. Four months later, nobody's POV. Kamazuku, keep it up! His physical therapist encouraged, watching the boy struggling to hold himself upright. You've finally managed to stand up on your own, now let's take that first step. You can do it! Izuku exclaimed as he tightly gripped the bars he was using to support himself, the muscles in his arms burning. Sweat poured off Izuku's brow as his legs began to buckle. A few moments later, Izuku collapsed to the ground, panting heavily. It hurts. Don't worry, buddy, you're doing an amazing job, the physical therapist said with a smile, before handing Izuku a water bottle. After you drink this, how about we stop for today? No, Izuku said as he grabbed the bottle of water and took several long gulps. I can keep going. I need to keep going. Okay then, I like the enthusiasm. The physical therapist said with a smile, patting the young boy on the shoulder. Why don't we take a small break then? I need to talk with Nine for a minute. Okay. Izuka said as he nodded his head, taking another gulp of water. I need to catch my breath anyway. How's he doing? Nine asked, watching Izuka try to pep himself up once again. It looks like he's struggling. Quite the opposite, actually the physical therapist said with a smile as she stood next to Nine. For most people, it takes many more months, sometimes even years, to get where Izuku is now. For him to be standing up already, even with support, is simply amazing. I've been doing this job for a long time and I've worked with a lot of patients. The physical therapist said as she released a light sigh. For most people, they just seem to give up hope after they don't start seeing results after a few sessions. The road to recovery is long and difficult, and some people can't make that journey but this boy is different, it's quite refreshing. He's optimistic and wants to work every day. It gives me hope that he will make a full recovery one day. I know he'll do it. Nine said with a small smile, locking eyes with the physical therapist. The boy is a fighter just like his mother, and I know he'll overcome this. You're a blight to heroics. I should have known better and expelled you. Nobody's could be that perfect of a hero. No one could be that selfless. You just sought power like the rest of the league. Eraserhead's words rang in Izuka's mind as he starred down his water bottle, a picture of all of UA's staff on the side. His former sensei had come by four days after Izuka was arrested, demanding he tell the Eraser hero where the rest of the league was hiding. A wave of anger hit him as he grabbed the rails. Izuka managed to get back up on his feet. His legs were wobbling and his knees were buckling, but he was still standing. Izuka tried to take a step forward, but his body wasn't listening to him. Breathing through grit teeth, Izuka tried to raise his leg up, but it felt like he was trying to lift a bag of bricks. Huffing in frustration, Izuka tightly gripped the railings he was using for support. With a fiery determination burning in his emerald green eyes, Izuku inhaled deeply to ready himself. Nizu, I showed just how big of a mistake you and those idiots made. Once we're done with today's session, I believe we should dash. The physical therapist stopped mid-sentence when she glanced over and spotted Izuku. Her eyes slowly widened as she watched Izuku take an awkward step forward. I don't believe it. What are you, Dash? Nine suddenly gasped, watching as the boy took another shaky step, tears forming in his eyes due to the pain. Smirking underneath his mask, Nine was filled with a sea of pride. Oh my god, it's amazing. Look, guys. Izuku exclaimed, a massive smile spreading across his face as he took another small step forward. I'm doing it. One year later. End of year three second term at UA. Izuku is 21, I think. Izuku had made great strides in the past 16 months. He was now able to walk and run again, albeit he could only run in quick bursts unlike the marathons he used to complete in one go. He took up yoga and tai chi to lessen the pain in his back and arms, making them tolerable on most days. He also became close with his cellmates, even telling them about one for all once he felt they were trustable enough. He also learned that Nine's real name was Kugo Tenki. Tenki is Japanese for weather. Izuka was currently sitting on his bed reading when two guards walked in. 
Guard 1, on your feet boy. Guard 2, what my idiot of a partner means to say is that you should come with us since the wardens want to talk to you. Izuku nodded and left with the guards. Tartarus had multiple floors and housed the worst of, that much Izuku knew. But he soon noticed that the higher up he went, the nicer the floor was compared to the dark and gritty lower levels. Izuku stopped in front of a set of ivory-white doors with gold designs on them. The guards knocked and a voice responded. One, come in please. Izuka entered and saw two men who looked to be in their later twenties. Elias, I'm Elias, Elias Shni. And the person next to me is my twin brother Yayas Shni. Elias, the one who told Izuku to enter, had light blue eyes and white hair that had a bang on the right side of his face. He wore a white overcoat, with a dark blue undercoat, gray sweater, a red necktie and a pair of gray gloves. His suit pants shared the same color as his overcoat and were tucked into silver boots accented in gray. He had two scimitars that had blades that were arctic blue. The handles were ivory white and had the design of two gold Chinese dragons wrapping around the handle before stopping on the ends of the hilt. He reminded Izuku of an Atlas military office. Iayas had blue eyes and white almost gray looking hair. He wore a gray turtleneck shirt with a white double-breasted coat, light gray gloves, a gunmetal gray jacket with a red inside and arm capes. He had black dress pants with metal knee pads and shoes that reminded Izuku of his iron soles. He wielded two ninjato swords that could transform into pistols. Yes, one of our guards has a lie detector quirk and he says you're innocent. The quirk never lies so we believe him and you. Izuku, shock and amazement you do? Elias, of course we do. And besides, who the hell allows a bunch of kids to beat up their classmate and then put said classmate in one of the most dangerous prisons of all time? Yes. We've both seen all the proof and even somebody in their first few months of law school could prove your innocence with the amount of holes the evidence has. Izuku, then they're all idiots for believing that shit. Also why am I still in here? Elias, number one, agreed. And number two, we think some of the higher-ups in the government wanted you out of the picture. Our guess is on the Hero Public Safety Commissioner. You were making waves as Atlas and were threatening to unravel everything she and her predecessor worked hard to create. Izuku. So I'm basically stuck in here forever. Elias, not quite. Izuku, huh? Yes, Tartarus is going to hold a tournament called the Prison Spets Competition, PSC. It'll be a fighting tournament between the best fighters locked up in Tartarus, Blackwater, and Cryptarium. It'll consist of three-person teams. The winning team gets their freedom back. Izuku, when does it start? Elias, it'll start in April, but the other prisoners don't know about it yet. We're going to tell them in March when the other two prisons arrive in order to let them all prepare. Izuku, so I'm getting an early start on training for the PSC essentially. Yes, yes, and you can tell your cellmates so they can help you train. Izuku, thank you both. Izuku headed to the door and was about to leave when a memory came to him. Angry, you're just like my younger brothers Elias and Yes. Only seeing the good in society and never any of the bad. Izuku shook his head and turned to the brothers. Izuku. Sorry to ask this, but y'all's names brought back an old memory from New York. Do y'all have an older brother by the name of Yaritsa by any chance? Elias and Yaritsa looked at Izuku in shock at the mention of the thought to be dead brother. Elias, how do you know his name? Izuku, Siege of New York, the unknown villain that leveled an entire city block in Manhattan. The twins were hurt by the knowledge that their older brother had fallen to evil. Yaritsa, Yaritsa is he. Izuku shrugged his shoulders. Izuku. I fought him one-on-one -on -one and gave him some serious damage to his face and arms while getting some serious damage of my own in exchange. Elias, well, thank for giving us some peace of mind at least. Izuku nodded and headed out. Elias and Yayas then leaned back on their desks and groaned. Yayas looked up at Elias. Yayas, Eli we need to tell Dad. Elias, tell him what exactly? That the son he thought he got killed might possibly be alive? That Yeritsa who we all treated like a monster because of who his mother is, survived the silent sparrow accident and became a revolutionary villain? Yes, then what do you suggest we do? Elisa, I don't know, but I'll think of something. Izuku, I'm back you filthy animals, no offense Chojuro. Chimera, none taken. Rappa, so where have so been greeny? Barrows said you got sent to meet the wardens. Izuku, well. Izuku then proceeded to tell them about his meet with the Shni twins how they believed him and that the evidence was apparently not that solid. He also told them about the upcoming tournament of prisoners. That got a round of exasperated groans from everyone, even the vestiges who had came out to see what all the fuss was about. Overhaul, 
You're going to enter, aren't you? Before Izuka could speak, Nana and Tashinori beat him to it. Nana, of course he is. Tashinori, this is possibly his only chance at becoming a free man again. Kugo, he's not doing it. When that tournament comes around we're all sitting out of it. Izuku, why not? Kugo, because it took you sixteen months to get you where you are now. Your body still hurts whenever you move, so how do you think it's going to feel when you get hit? Not to mention you're out of shape when it comes to combat. Rappa, then we'll train him up again. Izuku, okay if I can't join then why shouldn't you? Kugo, because nobody's waiting for me. At least not anymore I think. Izuku, is your family. Kugo, no they're alive. I went out for a smoke nineteen years ago and never went back inside. Everyone looked at Nain in shock at the admission that he abandoned his family. Izuka frowned at Kugo. Kugo, if you're looking at me like that then I guess my wife would be looking ready to murder me. I'd be surprised if she didn't file for divorce. Tashinori, seeing as how young Midoriya's father left around the same time and his mother still hasn't divorced a man, you never know what might happen. Kugo, true. Anyways let's put it to a vote then if Izuka should participate in the competition. Kugo grumbled in frustration as he finally relented. Kugo, fine, we'll help you train. Izuku nodded before turning to the others. Izuku, all right then, let's get this started. Scene change. Music, I'm at war with the world and they try to pull me into the dark. We see Izuku going over his training regiment with the others. Music, I struggle to find my faith. As I'm slipping from your arms. Kugo and Stain will be his fitness trainer to keep Izuku in shape. Rappa and Chimera will teach him hand to hand. Mummy will train him with eraser heads binding cloth style. The Serpenter Twins Sword Combat. Scene change. We see Izuka hitting a punching bag, his arms on fire with each strike. Music. It's getting harder to stay awake. And my strength is fading fast. You breathe into me at last. Memories of his ex friends came into his head, make him so angry he punched the bag and sent it off its chain. Scene change. We see Izuka punching and kicking Chimera. Music, I'm awake I'm alive. Now I know what I believe inside. Chimera blocked every punch and dodged every kick before punching Izuku in the chest and sending him flying back. Scene change. Izuku is trying to do push-ups as his back threatens to split in half again. Music, now it's my time. I'll do what I want cause this is my life. Overhaul creates lightweight metal slabs and Rappa puts them on Izuku's back after every odor push-up gradually raising the weight on his back. Music here, right here, right now, right now. I'll stand my ground and never back down. Images of Momo and Uraraka smiling happily appear in Izuka's mind, causing him to pick up the pace in doing his push-ups. Rappa stopped putting slabs on his back and started cheering on Izuku, even having him do different kinds of push-ups. Scene change. Izuku is punching a wall with the techniques Rappa taught him. Music, I know what I believe inside. I'm awake and I'm alive. Gran Torino's words echo through Izuka's mind. His fist tightened as he sent a punch to the wall that caused a huge crack without Oafe. The feet both shocked and impressed Rappa. Scene change. Music. I'm at war with the world cause I. Ain't never gonna sell my soul. Izuka is sitting in front of Nizu. The hybrid creature was telling Izuka that his sentence could be reduced if he admitted his crimes and revealed everything he knew about the League's location and current operations. Izuku just glared at the chimera and refused before leaving the principal alone in the room. Music, I've already made up my mind. No matter what I can't be bought or sold. Scene change. Music, when my faith is getting weak. And I feel like giving in. You breathe into me again. Izuku was on his arms and he's panting as his entire body ached. Tashinori appeared in front of Izuku and encouraged him to keep going forward. Scene change. Music, I'm awake I'm alive. Now I know what I believe inside. Now it's my time. I'll do what I want cause this is my life. Here, right here, right now, right now. I'll stand my ground and never back down. I know what I believe inside. I'm awake and I'm alive. Izuku was fighting against Stain and Nine. Neither villain led up against Izuku as he kept blocking their attacks. Scene change. Music, in the dark. I can feel you in my sleep. Izuku way lying down on his bed as he thought about his mom and how she might be doing. His thoughts then turned to Koda, Eri, Katsuma, and Mahoro. He wondered how his four adopted children were doing. Music, in your arms I feel you breathe into me. Forever hold this heart that I will give to you. Forever I will live for you. Final scene change. Music, waking up, waking up. 
Waking up, waking up. Killer B turns off the MP3 player. Izuku sighs, three months of that song on repeat. Rappa, yeah but you can't deny the results of the training. Izuku, true. Overhaul, also are you gonna tell us how you got that? Overhaul pointed to Izuku's chest. The left side of his chest contained a scar surrounded by burn marks. The scar itself had five circular marks that were the size of human fingers and looked as if someone had used their hand like a blade and stabbed him. Izuku grimaced as he touched his wound and recalled his battle against Yaritsa who had given him that injury three years ago during the siege of New York. It was only due to dumb luck that he had survived that fight. Izuku, maybe some other time. Izuku was woken up by nine shaking his bed. Izuku looked at the clock and saw that it was five in the morning, two hours earlier than when he would usually wake up. He heard voices outside the cell. Voices he knew didn't belong to any of the guards or prisoners in Tartarus. Izuku, yawning, so I take it that the prisoners from Cryptarium and Blackwater are here? Izuku questioned as he sat up on his bed. Nine nodded as he helped Izuku get up. Chimera, they arrived half an hour ago. They've been making a ruckus ever since. Tengai, no respect for other people and their sleep. The doors to their cell opened up. Head guards of Blackwater, Tartarus, and Cryptarium. All right, maggots, line up. Izuku, Nine, his crew, Flectern, Barrows, Serpentus, Sidero, Leviathan, Stain, Overhaul, and the Precepts went outside. Some of the prisoners from Blackwater started to snarl and growl when they saw Izuku. Slice, concerned, kid, why are they acting like that? Izuku, because I fought them during the siege of New York and was the one who put them in Blackwater. Overhaul, you better be careful then. They might see this tournament as a chance to get payback against you. Izuku noted. Any other discussion was interrupted as Elias and Eis walked into the main room with two other people, a man and a woman. Izuku recognized them as the heroes Red Bolt and Sunfire. Elias Shni, good morning my charges. The two people next to me and my brother are Tetsuya, Red Bolt, Rita and Maxine, Sunfire, Burns. They are also the wardens of Blackwater and Cryptarium respectively. Sunfire, we're sure you all are wondering why you all are here. Everything will be explained to you lot right now. Red Bolt, and who better to explain it than Ultra Academy's principal, Niza. Izuku's blood boiled and started seeing red as he watched Niza walk into the room. Izuku soon felt a very extreme urge to kill the rat. And Izuku was not the only one who wanted to do so. Random prisoner, bastard. A prisoner from Cryptarium yelled out. His arms were covered by spiral shockwaves of purple fire and jumped down so he could attack Nizu. He didn't get far as Sunfire pulled out a remote and pressed the button on it, causing the prisoner's head to explode. All of us, even Elias, Yias, and Ryota were in shock at what she did. Nizu, like Sunfire, was unaffected by this and brushed off the bits of brain matter that fell on his shoulder. Nizu, now that that minor disruption is over with, prisoners of Blackwater, Tartarus, and Cryptarium, I have an announcement. Starting next month we will be holding a battle royale tournament. You all will be on three-person teams where each match, either you, one of your teammates, or the entire team will have to fight. Can you all just imagine it? This violent bloodbath being broadcasted to the entire world to see. Blackwater inmate, and why should we participate exactly? Nizu, because the winning team will get their freedom back. Everyone instantly got excited after that. The prisoners I faced in New York gave me a look that said, Payback time. Scene change. Izuku was in the yard looking for two people to team up with. It had been a week and nearly every prisoner had teams. Anyways, two people walked up to Izuku while he was looking for partners. Hey kid! Izuku turned and saw them. A lean and reasonably muscled man with short, spiky hair and green eyes. He wore basic armor and green cape. His most identifiable feature was a shield. If Izuku had to guess, the man looked about twenty years old. Second was a fair-skinned young girl with silver eyes and black hair, which fades into red tips. Her hair was in a shoulder-length style. Her outfits consist of blacks, reds, grays slash silver and creams, though her most prominent accessory is her red cape and hood. She stood slightly over five feet tall and was about Izuku's age. Now Fumi, I'm now Fumi Iwadani. Ruby, and I'm Ruby, Ruby Rose. Izuku, Izuku Midoriya. They all shook each other's hands. Now Fumi. We noticed you were looking around the yard and other places for the last week. I take it you don't have a team yet? Izuku, shaking his head, no, and most of the prisoners here want to kill me seeing as I'm a hero student, or was one. Ruby, what do you mean was? Izuku, I was framed for committing treason and working with villains. Now for me, so you're just like us. 
Izuku, huh? Ruby, I was framed for hacking the CCT system and collaborating with Salem to cause the breach of Vale. The only people who believe I'm innocent are my family, my team, and a few of my friends. Now for me. I was accused of being a part of a coup against the Melromark crown and killing the queen. I know for a fact that it was Queen Morelia's two-faced bastard of a son. Only my party believes I'm innocent. In my Omalti is nice and has a twin brother who has her canon personality. Izuku ouch. Sorry for you too. Now for me, thanks for your sympathies. Ruby, so can we be a team together? Izuku, sure, let's go tell the wardens. Now for me, alright. The three headed off to the warden's office. Warden's office. Inside the office, Elias and EIS were doing paperwork when they heard it. Knock, knock, knock. EIS, enter. The brothers turned to see Izuku entering the office. Izuku was holding the team entry form for the prison spets competition. Elias, ah Izuku, we see you've got the form filled out. Izuku, nodding, yes, my teammates are going to be Awatani and Rose. Elias and EIS almost had to do a double take when they heard that name. EIS Rose? Ruby Rose? Izuku showed them the form and sure enough, Ruby Rose was on it as a prisoner of Criterium. Elias, what's she doing in prison? Izuku, same like me, she was framed for working with Salem, causing the breach, and hacking the CCT. EIS, well that a load of bull. We've meet the girl and we know for a fact that she doesn't have it in her to do stuff like that. Elias, anyways is that all? Izuku yes sirs. Elias, then you're free to go. You and your teammates can use our personal training room. Izuku turned and left. Elias then sat at his desk and groaned as he pulled out a bottle of scotch to drink. Elias, Jesus Christ James, what were you thinking? Meanwhile, Izuku walked into the training room and spotted Naofumi and Ruby already there. Izuku, before we train let's get to know each other's abilities, I'll go first. Ah, uh, can you two keep a secret? Naofumi and Ruby both nodded. Izuku, all right, I'm Izuku Midoriya and my quirk is called, one for all, a quirk that can be transferred through DNA. Naofumi and Ruby were shocked to say the least. Ruby, a transferable quirk? Naofumi, how does that even exist? Izuku proceeded to reveal the secret of OF8 to his teammates. The vestiges even showed up at one point to prove the point. Naofumi, Ruby, can you go next since my brain still hurts from that explanation? Ruby, okay. My semblances, pedal burst, and I can dash in any direction at super fast speeds and generate trails of rose petals. Now for me, I wield the legendary shield, which can absorb materials, store items, and gives me great offensive and defensive power. I have five special abilities. Airstrike shield, I can create a shield-shaped barrier. I can throw it at opponents or use it as a platform. Shield prison, I can create a prison of shields to trap my enemies. Fireball. I can shoot a fireball from my shield. Blizzard. I can summon a storm of ice and snow to stun and freeze my enemies. Electric Fury. I can create a field of lightning and shoot it from my shield. Izuku. And I thought I was strong. Anyways let's start training. The trio got up and took fighting stances before charging at one another. Three weeks had passed and all the prisoners were inside a stadium that looked like the one Yui used for the sports festival. Only this one was thrice the size of said stadium. The seats were filled with civilians, rich people, pros, and hero students. All the teams walked out into the center of the stadium. Izuku's team was getting things thrown at them and jeers from half the audience while the other half defended and cheered for them. Izuku searched around the hero students section of the stands, and he saw two scenes that multiplied his fury twentyfold. Izuku's POV My vision started to turn red at the sight of my former best friends being with my ex-fiancés. I felt my rage boiling as I clenched my fist super tight, almost drawing blood. Ida looked at me and gave me smug dumbass smirk. I was about to do something rash when I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around and saw Naofumi looking at me with worry. Naofumi? Worried, are you okay? Izuku, no I'm not. Ruby, so those two girls were your ex fiancés I nodded while Naofumi patted me on the back. Naofumi. Honestly, man, you deserve better than them if fraudulent evidence is all it takes for them to turn against you. Izuku, you're right now for me. Anyways, do you all see people you know? Now for me, see that group over there? They're my teammates. The girl with the raccoon ears and the girl with the crimson ponytail hair are my girlfriends. Ruby over here. Izuku, now for me, and Ruby turned to see a girl with long golden hair sitting next to a girl with black hair and cat ears. A girl that reminded Izuku of EIS except she had white hair that was tied into a ponytail, 
and she wore a strapless, thigh-high dress. A boy with blonde hair wearing a chest plate and elbow guards. And lastly, a girl with pink and brown hair and heterochromic eyes. Ruby Sis. Any further talk was halted when the wardens all appeared on a podium. Everyone became silent as Sunfire spoke up. Sunfire, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the 8th Prison Spets competition. The PSC was first established as a death match to combat overflowing prisons. The winner would be granted their freedom and be recognized as one of the toughest people alive. Over the years, the PSC has went from a solo death battle to a team-based tournament with just as much violence but without the killing. It was discontinued a few decades ago due to some of the villains rallying together and escaping, causing a massive death toll in spectators, guards, and other prisoners. EIS, new restrictions and precautions have now been put in place to prevent that from happening again. Now without further ado, give it up UA's very own Principal Nizu. The crowd went wild while my eye twitched as my anger threatened to explode out of my body and strangle the damned rat. Both Naofumi and Ruby put a hand on my shoulders to keep me from doing something stupid. Nizu, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon everyone, it is a great day for the world to see these scumbags get what's coming to them. But not only that, the winning team will get both 15 million US dollars and their freedom. 32 teams, 96 people, and only 3 of them will be victorious in this tournament. Now let's see these bastards get what's coming to them. Everyone cheered even louder this time. If it weren't for my team, I would have jumped up to the platform and killed Nizu. Nizu, now the first set of battles will be 1v1 style matches. Now let us see which two fighters will open this tournament. The Jumbotron started spinning like a roulette wheel and shows the first person. Nizu, Nigrisi Agnolasa, a biogeneticist serving 24 life sentences for his illegal experimentation on people. With a height of 5 feet 9 inches and weighing over 250 pounds of pure muscle due to him altering his body, he's special in that he was born with two quirks. And his opponent is... The Jumbotron spun for a few seconds before stopping. Todoroki, Momo, and Yurarika gasped in shock while Nizu, Ida, and half the audience looked in glee. Now you all might be wondering, what poor schmuck was unlucky enough to face off against that brute of a man? Well, that poor schmuck happens to be telling this story. Nizu, the Yue traitor, Izuka Midoriya. Serving 58 life sentences for treason, attempted murder, murder, etc. Crowd, evidence believers bow. Kirishima, kick that two-faced bastard's ass to kingdom come. Nizu, standing at 5 feet 5 inches and weighing over 145 pounds, he has a strength and speed enhancer quirk but he might also have more due to the league giving many in exchange for his work. I realized that the picture and info he said was before getting arrested so they don't know how much I've changed. This could work in my favor. The guards brought me and Agnolasa out to the arena. Nizu, this will be completely one-sided if anyone were to ask me. Ha ha! Izuka's POV. That first fight is one I think about even eight years later. Agnolasa was a real pain in the ass to deal with. And that's saying something since I shared a prison with Muscular, who keeps asking for fight, and a cell with Rappa, who also keeps asking for a fight. Anyways, I reached the gate on my side of the arena when Nizu started revealing my old stats again for some reason. Nizu, Izuka Midoriya, serving 58 life sentences for crimes against both UA and Japan. Izuku, angry, I was framed. I yelled as I grabbed the gate. For a moment, Nizu and I locked eyes. Nizu soon looked back to the crowd and continued as if nothing happened. Nizu, with a height of 5 feet 5 inches. Izuku, at another 9 inches. Nizu and a weight of 145 pounds. Izuku, plus an extra 55 pounds of muscle from my training. Nizu, his quirk, a strength and speed enhancer. But he can't even control it fully. A measly 20%. This time it was Tashinori who retorted. Tashinori, wrong Nizu, my boy can now use 75% of the quirk plus some of the quirks of the past wielders. Nizu, I feel this fight will be quite the one-sided beatdown and I will enjoy every second of watching him suffer for what he did to my wards. Nizu and the wardens walked off to their arena suite to watch the fight. My gates opened up and I walked into the arena. The side of the audience that believed me was shocked by the scars and Lichtenberg marks I got from my former friends. I glanced at Momo and Yurarika one last time and I saw them gasp at how I looked. They had a conflicted look on their faces. I simply scoffed before turning to look at the other gate. With Mama Inko. Nobody's POV. Inko is sitting in the living room having tea with Mitsuki and Masaru. Mitsuki was scrolling through the TV channels. Masaru, Inko, 
How's Azuka doing? Inko, honestly, I don't know. He hasn't visited me in two years. Whenever I call it goes straight to voicemail. I tried to go to UA but they rejected me, saying I'm not allowed to visit. Why? Masaru, well, whenever we see Katsuki he seems conflicted about something but doesn't say anything. And when we try to pry it from him, he seems scared for some reason. Mitsuki's scream drew their attention as the Bakugo matriarch pointed to the TV. What they saw shocked them. TV Mizu, Izuka Midoriya, serving 58 life sentences for crimes against both UA and Japan. TV Izuku, I was framed. The three adults looked at the screen as if thinking this was some sort of sick joke. Mitsuki, bullshit. Izuka would sooner die than work with villains. Inko, when did this happen? How did TH? Inko paused as she suddenly realized that her son's communication blackout from her made perfect sense now. She also realized a few other things, causing her to release a murderous aura that caused Mitsuki and Masaru to flinch away from her. Inko, they arrested my boy without notifying me. They didn't even give him a trial since it would have been on the news. Masaru get my old law books, the Emerald Viper is coming out of retirement. Mitsuki shuddered as she remembered that when Inko was still a civil attorney and a prosecutor, she left no survivors and took no prisoners. Alchemax Labs In the Alchemax Labs building, a brown-haired woman in a skimpy black dress and mechanical armor was walking through the labs eating a donut when she saw all the scientists all looking at something. Annoyed, she walked over to see what was so important that they left their stations. What are you grunts doing? The scientists all jumped when they heard her voice. Scientist 1, Madame Estonia, we were just, um. He gestured to the TV and motioned for Estonia to look. When she walked over to the TV, she almost chalked on the piece of donut she was eating before she ran to her office and grabbed a phone. The phone had an emblem of a human skull with long horn-like protrusions coming out the top of the skull. Estonia, sir I need you to tune in to the Battle Fight Night channel now. Elsewhere her leader, a scarred man sitting in a device of some sorts, did as told. He was intrigued when he saw the boy he fought in New York standing in a prison. He would need to keep a close eye on this. In the U.S. Star. Kathleen Bate looks up, moving some of her long blonde locks out of her face. She's in the gym at her squad's little base. It's less of a hero agency and more of a military compound, but she knew what she was getting into when she joined the government's training program rather than a hero school. Calling her as one of her brothers in arms, Ethan Drive. Ethan had a shocked look as he pointed to the TV that hung overhead in the gym. Looking to the TV, Kathleen was just as shocked, even horrified by what she saw. She saw Izuka Midoriya the successor of her, Master, a boy that was her brother in all but blood, standing in a Tartarus arena wearing a prison jumpsuit. Scars and Lichtenberg figures danced all over his arms, legs, and chest. Kathleen, horrified, bro brother? Back with Izuku, nobody's POV. The second gate was opening up when two hands suddenly grabbed the bottom of the gate, and violently lifted it up. Out walks Agnalasa as the gate behind him crashes down due to him breaking the mechanism. Izuku and Agnalasa both looked at each other as the referee walks up to the podium. Referee, are both sides ready? Izuku nodded while Agnalasa just grunted out what sounded like a yes. Referee, all right. Three, two, one, fight. Agnalasa charged at Izuku and threw the first punch. The punch landed on Izuku's gut and sent him a few feet back. Izuku coughed up blood and spit as he got back up and just barely dodging a double axe handle that formed a crater in the spot where Izuku just stood seconds ago. Announcer, not even a minute into the fight and Izuku Midoriya of Team Traders is struggling to stay in the fight. Izuku rolled out of the way as Agnalasa slammed his foot down. The impact was strong enough to create a shockwave that pushed Izuku back. Izuku, he's relentless. Izuku dodged again as Agnalasa punched the ground and created another small crater. Izuku, and he's so strong. Can the arena even hold him? Agnalasa, you coward! Stop running away from me and SD. Agnalasa didn't get to finish his sentence as Izuku sent him flying with a 50% Texas smash to the face. Announcer, and would you look at that? Izuku Midoriya has just landed his first strike on Agnalasa. But it seems Agnalasa isn't done just yet. Danger sense rang out like a siren, causing Izuku to look at Agnalasa, who was getting back up. Agnalasa, that's it, time to end this once and for all. Now I'll crush you. Izuku watched in shock as Agnalasa grew in size and became taller than the top of the stadium. Announcer, it seems that Agnalasa is done playing around cause he just activated his first quirk, Gigantamax, which allows him to grow anywhere between a couple inches to 82 feet in height. Izuku, 
Well, you know the old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Agnalasa wound up a punch and struck down, creating a wormhole that his giant fist disappeared through. A second wormhole opened above Izuku's head. Ruby, Izuku! Above you! Izuku looked up just as the fist came through. Izuku caught the fist but it was in vain as Agnalasa's fist slammed him into the ground. Ruby, his fist! It just warped across the ring. Now for me, don't tell me his second quirk allows him to bend space itself? Announcer, oh and Agnalasa just used his second quirk spatial warp, which allows him to bend space in order to teleport and open portals. Izuku groaned as he peeled himself off the ground and muttered to himself. Izuku, this is gonna be harder than I originally thought. Izuku readied himself as Agnalasa sent a flurry of punches. Agnalasa, hyperspace barrage. Izuku was sent fly all over the arena as every punch connected. Izuku soon heard bones cracking and realized that his ribs were all definitely broken. An idea soon came into his mind. Izuku guys. Zephyr, it's a long shot but it might work. Matsuda, you just need to time it just right. Tashinori, while it is risky, it might possibly be your only shot at victory too. Nana, heads up. Izuku looked to see Agnalasa charging right at him preparing to punch him into the floor. Izuku, here goes nothing. Izuku charged up Oefe, waiting as Agnalasa came closer and... Banjo, now! Izuku jumped up right before the fist hit the ground and landed on hit. Izuku activated F.A. Gene and Gearshift as he lunged straight at Agnalasa's head, aiming for the giant red crystal on his forehead. Izuku, Detroit Smash. Izuku slammed his fist into the crystal, causing it to crack and turn gray as Agnalasa fell on his back and shrank down to normal size. Referee, Agnalasa has B. Agnalasa, no. I still stand. Everyone looked over to see Agnalasa getting back up as the crystal on his forehead started to heal itself. Izuka became pissed at the fact that this guy wouldn't guy down. Agnalasa roared in fury as he charged at Izuku and sent a kick at his face. Izuku moved his head and grabbed Agnalasa's face, slamming his opponent into the ground. The referee jumped down and walked up to the scene. Agnalasa was down and didn't appear to be conscious. Referee, winner by knockout victory, Izuku Midoriya. The crowd erupted into a mix of boos and cheers. Elias and EIS breathed out sighs of relief as they turned their heads to look at Jakuna Mainu, the hero public safety commissioner. The glass in her hand threatened to break as she clutched it fiercely in her anger. EIS smirked in delight at seeing her like that. It always brought a smile to his face whenever he saw the woman in such a state. Guards entered the arena and dragged Agnalasa's unconscious body back into the prison. Izuka limped away as Niza called up Naofumi and a girl from Agnalasa's team who could turn her fingers into swords. Izuku re-entered the prison and collapsed against the wall. Hearing footsteps, he turned his head to see Nine with a first aid kit and a bucket. Nine, here, drink this. Nine handed Izuku a water bottle which he took. Izuku took a few sips and sloshed it inside his mouth before spitting it into the bucket. The water had a red coloration to it due to the blood that was in Izuku's mouth. Nine began disinfecting Izuku's injuries as Izuku winced in pain. Nine, now, what did you do wrong in that fight? Izuku. I got cocky and underestimated the strength of my opponent. Nine nodded as he finished cleaning the wounds and started to stitch the cuts and gashes Izuku received. Nine, you got lucky in there. The only reason you won was because you disoriented him. Had he not been, that kick would have ended you. Nine finished stitching the cut on Izuku's forehead and placed a bandage on it. Nine, can you walk? Izuku, I barely got myself into the prison and propped my body against the wall. What do you think? Nine moved to Izuku's left leg and felt around it. Izuku groaned in pain as he did so. Nine, not broken but it is definitely sprained. You'll be able to walk on it with NI problems when the next set of battles comes around. Nine lifted Izuku and carried him back to their cell. 